All right, Bill, I'll, I'll go ahead. It's a little bit after two o'clock and, and kick things off and I could admit people as uh, they come in. So um, on behalf of CyberCrunch and Potter, Anderson and Karun, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today uh, for our webinar on data privacy laws. Uh, we are very fortunate today to have Mr. Bill Denny, a partner at Potter Anderson who has a business in litigation practice focusing on commercial and corporate transactions, vendor management, merger and acquisitions, data privacy and security, as well as information technology to be our guest speaker. Um, if you are not already muted on your phones and or your microphones for your computers, if you can do so uh, to eliminate any background noise. Um, also, if there's any questions that you will have, they can be submitted uh, via the chat window, which is in the upper right hand uh, corner of the screen, and we will address those uh, towards the end of the presentation. Or if Bill wants to take a breather to get a drink of water, um, Roxanne and Barb will uh, have those questions and we can read them out. So, um, without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Bill to, to kick things off and appreciate everybody joining. Great. Thanks very much, Greg. And one question before I get started Are we recording this session? Yes, so that yes, thank you so much for reminding me. So I wanted to let everybody know that this uh, session is being recorded. Um, so just to, to put that out there, and also at the end of the uh, presentation, we will make this available to everybody uh, via uh, a slideshow. So okay. thank you for reminding me, Bill. Thank you. No problem. So um, there's lots of privacy and cyber questions that we can, that we have to discuss that are arising. In COVID era, and the question for you is how are they coming up for you, for you and for your business? Uh, we'll discuss uh, recent privacy trends as well as ethical guidance, and what I've listed here are the areas that I plan to discuss, talk about the, uh, the privacy impacts that we're seeing recently, we'll talk about some of the comprehensive privacy laws that have been passed or updated this year. Also, what are the general data security requirements that your business has? What laws are changing? Biometrics is a rapidly changing area, um, as is geolocation and contact tracing, specifically due to the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. We'll talk about instruction obligations, and finally, I'll give you some tips, recommended actions that you take back with you. Bill, are you there? We lost the sound. Still can't hear you, Bill. Okay, how's that? There you go. That's better. Yep. Um, I, I got this odd automatic muting, but if it happens again, I know what to do. Okay. okay. So there have been serious privacy impacts happening recently, some due to COVID, some due to um, our modern electronic age. Um, in this age, we're all carrying cell phones, and we all can be tracked. And every piece of data about us creates evidence. It's a fragment and can be and can be a significant risk to our security. One example of this is the online fitness tracker Strava. Uh, Strava is a San Francisco-based company that provides an app that uses a mobile phone's GPS to track a subscriber's exercise activity. It uses data that it collects as well as collects from uh, Fitbit and Jawbone and other apps for uh, individuals to check their performance and share it with others. What happened was it was discovered um, through looking at the heat map created by Strava that you could zero in on military bases in secure locations and identify specific activities of, of troops and soldiers where they commonly exercise, uh, where they patrol. This was a significant security risk. And the picture you see here 
is the uh, General Communication Headquarters um, of the United Kingdom, uh, which is highly secure. It's like the U.S. CIA or the um, or the NSA, and you can see um, superimposed on a Google map, heat map showing exactly where people are going. Uh, the higher, the um, brighter activity indicates level of activity, intensity of use. So um, this was discovered. It's, it's a huge security risk, and the bigger worry is whether Strava's activity data could be used to identify interesting individuals and track them to other sensitive or secretive locations. Another recent event which was uh, very tragic was uh, relating to Judge Esther Salas, who is a U.S. District Judge in New Jersey, a, um, a disturbed, struggling lawyer armed with a gun, researched her and found her private, personal um, home address. She went there and, and uh, wanting to attack her, killed her son and severely wounded her husband. She put out a, a very moving video yesterday that I encourage you to find online and look at where she addresses the privacy concerns for federal judges and asks for everybody's help in protecting that information and protecting um, people from being tracked, uh, which can be used for very nefarious purposes. The um, Twitter hack that happened recently, within the last month, is the worst hack in Twitter's history. And it happened when a teenager, a Florida teenager, convinced a Twitter employee on the phone that he was a co-worker. And they ultimately granted him access to a host of Twitter accounts, including Barack Obama, Elon Musk, and Kane West. And he was doing it uh, to try to earn more Bitcoin, sending out um, sending out tweets under those accounts and saying, "Send me a thousand dollars of Bitcoin, and I'll send you back two thousand dollars of Bitcoin." You would think who would expect that to come from Barack Obama? But I think about 140 people fell for it, and um, but the FBI quickly tracked him down. But this is a huge um, this is a huge security risk when uh, when Twitter is used as mouthpiece for so many individuals and organizations. Um, and and working from home has simply increased the risk here. In March, Twitter ordered all of its employees to work from home. That created an ideal environment for the kinds of attacks that this 17-year-old perpetrated. Doom bombing is happening also because of people staying home because of COVID. People are on, on Zoom quite a bit. It's an application that has exploded in use, and it has security settings. And if you don't use the security settings, somebody who discovers your video code can show up on your call and, um, and sort of photobomb you called a Zoom bomb. And in fact, when there was a hearing in the social engineering Twitter hack case, somebody Zoom bombed that hearing and put up pornographic videos on the Zoom bomb, and it took the court quite a while to figure out how to how to disconnect that particular uh, person. So it can be very disruptive, as well as create potential liability for companies using that technology. Um, Clearview is, um, for me, one of the scariest examples here. It's a little-known startup that has helped law enforcement match photos of unknown people to their online images. This tiny company, Clearview, devised a groundbreaking facial recognition application. Its backbone was a database of more than 3 billion images that Clearview had scraped from Facebook, YouTube, Venmo, and millions of other sites. It's regardless of the fact that, that the terms of use of those sites say you're not allowed to scrape for photos. They did, and this goes far beyond anything ever constructed by the U.S. government. And without any public scrutiny, more than 600 law enforcement agencies have started using Clearview in the past year to identify people. They'll send in pictures, and they'll get matches that will precisely identify who people are. And there's even a way to pair it with augmented reality glasses. So here's a picture. 
users can walk down the street and potentially identify every person they see, not only by name, but by where they live, what they did, and whom they know. It's, it's very scary. And it's not just law enforcement, but Clearview is licensing this app to a handful of private companies, supposedly for security purposes. So if you have images of Big Brother, uh, this is where it's coming from. And surveillance is just heating up. We have the um, Black Lives Matter protests going on around the country. And how much are these facial recognition uh, applications being used to identify people who are lawfully protesting? Because of this, some cities have actually banned the use of facial recognition technology by their city departments, the first being San Francisco, later some other cities in California and also in Massachusetts. Also tech giants, Microsoft, Amazon, and IBM have enacted a one moratoria against using facial surveillance products. Uh, in Congress, Democrats have recently introduced legislation that would ban the government use of facial recognition software. I don't think that's going anywhere, but you can see um, it's a hot issue. <clears throat> 2020 has been a uh, busy year so far for legislative developments in cybersecurity and privacy. The most anticipated event uh, was the deadline for companies to comply with the California Consumer um, Privacy Act, the CCPA, uh, which went into effect on on January the 1st of this year, we've seen a lot of thorny data collection issues prompted by this pandemic. And on top of that, we've witnessed the demise of Privacy Shield, which is a popular transatlantic data transfer mechanism. This is very important to many thousands of companies that do international business and need to get data from, from European countries. The Corona virus pandemic has stalled momentum, both on the state level and federal level, to put more restrictions on how companies use and sell personal information. It shut down legislatures and it's diverted attention away from those issues. And one example of that is Washington State, which was poised to follow California's lead and uh, put on the books a comprehensive consumer privacy law similar to the Europeans GDPR. It had passed a year ago one house of the legislature in Washington, and this year, um, for the second year in a row, it failed to get approval before the legislature adjourned, uh, the disagreement being whether there should be a private right of action under the law. So I'll talk about some of the laws here on this list, um, as, and, and these, are, these are mostly privacy-related and some security-related laws. What is the CCPA and why is it such a big deal? CCPA is the first law in the US to give consumers the ability to find out what data companies hold about them and have this information deleted and opt out of the sale of this data. It's broadly applicable to businesses, regardless of their location, that collect or control personal information about California residents. Um, there is a threshold requirement so very small businesses may not be subject to it. However, um, with, with similar laws being enacted in other states, it has effectively become a floor for data rights across the country. Businesses are struggling with complying with this new law, even though they've had since July of 2018 to get into compliance. There's lots of questions about how it applies. It's very poorly written, and the corrections made by the legislature in the, in the, succeeding, in the succeeding two years have only corrected uh, very um, few of the problems. The state's attorney general has sought to address many of these issues through regulations. He's put out three different drafts of regulations, the latest being in February or March of 2020, and they've been submitted to the state for issuance, yet the final regulations are still not finalized, even though, even though in compliance uh, was required as of January 1st, and enforcement by the Attorney General 
started on on July the 1st. There's a lot of uncertainty that companies have and it's been very frustrating and require a lot of resources to monitor the moving target of compliance. The Attorney General was asked to delay enforcement due to COVID, but refused to do that. And uh, companies are watching for where his enforcement actions are going to start. Already, the California Attorney General has sent out many warning letters, giving companies 30 days to remedy their alleged violations. They focus largely on online companies' obligations to make available the statements and the mechanisms that are required by the law, including the tool to opt out of sale of data, which needs to be clearly and conspicuously present on home pages. In a survey by PricewaterhouseCoopers in late 2019, only 52% of the respondents are expected um, expected their companies to be compliant by January 2020. So um, there's a huge concern about how the enforcement is going to go. And what makes it even more challenging is there is a private right of action under this law so that if, if uh, an individual's data has been breached due to a company's, if a California resident's data has been breached due to a company's failure to, to implement reasonable security measures, they're subject to a private right of action with statutory damages, meaning they don't have to prove that the information has actually been misused. Uh, key components of the CCPA include vastly expanded consumer rights, and these rights have to be detailed in privacy notices that companies put on their websites. In addition to that, companies need to provide notice at the point of collection of information from the individuals. And when you look at business practices of companies that work online, it's very difficult to do that because sometimes collection happens behind the scenes. Companies are resorting to a lot of pop-up windows asking for consent, um, which is generally recognized now in the um, most recent uh, drafts of legislation as a very ineffective way to protect privacy. When you get so many consent requests, Naturally, you're going to stop reading them. You're just going to click accept, accept, accept. And so uh, this is just a preview. The new laws that are coming are going to include default rights to privacy, where instead of giving you the option to opt out of something, it's going to require you to specifically consent in writing to something before companies are able to use your information. And um, the reason this is so important is that companies, businesses, governmental agencies need to take very careful note about where their data is located, how they've collected it, what they're doing with it, how long they're going to keep it, how they dispose of it, to um, be able to comply with these laws as they continue to change. The law includes um, includes restrictions on transfer of data to anyone who is not a service provider as defined in the law. And that, that means that all of your contracts with vendors need to be very, very carefully comply with California CCPA so that transfers of data between a company and um, a customer and its vendor are not going to be subject to the um, opt-out right for sale of data. It won't be considered a sale of data in that case. There have been a number of changes made um, in the regulations um, that have provided some clarification. For example, in how do you verify? When somebody contacts a company and says, I want you to tell me all the information you've collected about me and give me copies of it. Well, how do you verify that person is whom he says he is? Because if it's not, and you give out the information to the wrong person, you've just committed a data breach. So there's some more specific guidance on, on what companies are allowed to rely upon. Also, there's been clarification as to how to provide notices to consumers, um, how to opt out, um, how to set up mechanism to allow consumers to opt out of sale, and also how to determine whether your financial incentives 
and your price or service differences constitute improper um, uh, improper discrimination, which is banned under CCPA. As if CCPA weren't enough, uh, now we have, also coming from California, the California Privacy Rights Act, the CPRA, and this is a ballot initiative uh, which, which has been started by Alastair McTaggart, who was the same person who started CCPA. Um, CCPA had started as a ballot initiative, but was then passed by the legislature. Um, they were terrified that a law would be passed that they wouldn't be able to amend. That's the problem with ballot initiatives. They can only be changed by another ballot initiative. So um, McTaggart decided that the CP CCPA had been watered down too much, and he wanted to have um, um, stronger privacy laws in California. And so he got enough signatures to get it on the ballot for November 2020. If it passes, and by the way, it's currently polling at about 80% favorable by the California residents, and I guarantee you 99% of them have not read it. Uh, they are going to pass it, and it's going to replace and expand CCPA. So companies that have spent millions on coming into CCPA compliance, it's not wasted because they'll still have to comply with all of those regulations, but there will be new protections put on top of that. And these include new obligations regarding a new category of data called sensitive data, where there is a uh, where the consumers have the right at any time to limit or, or, um, or prevent the use and disclosure of this sensitive data. Also, there are limitations to sharing of personal information for behavioral advertising, including tracking-based advertising. And so you're totally upending the entire online advertising industry. There are enhanced protections for minors with um, much higher statutory remedies statutory damages for violations. Also, they're setting up a new agency in California called the California Privacy Protection Agency, whose sole job will be to regulate and enforce privacy, um, privacy laws. And initially, um, it is to be populated with um, at least 50 people that are, that are doing the enforcement. And this is more, by the way, than our, than our working on privacy and security in the Federal Trade Commission, which is the main um, enforcement arm of the United States government for privacy. So California really is leading the way. There are other laws that I wanted to touch upon briefly. Maine introduced a new internet privacy law that took effect on July the 1st, 2020, and it applies to internet providers. So these are the service providers such as Verizon and Comcast who are, who are um, selling the internet services and it prohibits them, it, it, it allows uh, consumers to keep their internet search activities private, prohibits these companies from collecting internet search information unless there is a specific um, uh, consent to do so. It has some problems. There are no enforcement mechanisms, and also it doesn't apply to other internet actors such as search engines and social networks. But there was a lawsuit filed by internet service providers to try to stop this legislation. The uh, United States District Court in Maine um, denied that request on July 7th and upheld the law. So these large internet service providers are struggling how to enforce this because they can't, really, they can't really have one business model for Maine residents and another business model for everybody else. And so as these various state laws pass, it affects people in the whole country. Nevada has a law that applies to operators of internet websites and, and it took effect on October the 1st of 2019 and it potentially affects many of the same companies that will need to comply with the CCPA. It provides consumers with the right to opt out of the sale of their covered information. So again, um, internet service providers are gonna have to figure out and have had to figure out 
how are they going to um, how are they going to carry out the requirements of this law? With all of these different state laws, it's been clear to everybody that the real solution is going to be a comprehensive federal privacy law that will um, that will take the place of all of these uh, very burdensome and inconsistent state laws. So there has been momentum building at the federal level to establish uniform privacy legislation. Of course, it's also stalled. Um, although Congress may push to regulate a narrower subset of issues like biometrics or location privacy in the coming months. But all sides agree that some form of national privacy legislation would be extremely helpful. The problem is in the details. There's no agreement as to whether there should be a private right of action under the law. Uh, there's no agreement as to whether the law should preempt more stringent state laws or simply be a floor and say this is the minimum privacy that you need to um, provide and states can pass their own more stringent privacy requirements. The latest introduction on the federal level was a bill introduced on June 18 of 2020 um, and it would grant a private right of action. It would not preempt more protective state laws and so you'd still have the situation of having to keep up with all of the different state laws. It would, by the way, ban the use of facial recognition technology. Um, it would require um, accountability reporting for the use of artificial intelligence, and it would create a new independent agency with rulemaking and enforcement authority. So there's a lot happening in this area. On the international front, the court in the European Union uh, decided the Schrems II case on July 16, 2020, invalidating the key data transfer mechanism that was negotiated between the European Union and the United States Department of Commerce to allow data to transfer between the United States and Europe. Uh, the privacy law in Europe is called the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and it prohibits the transfer of data to countries that lack an adequate level of protection, absent some approved mechanism. And of course, as you guessed it, the United States lacks an adequate level of protection. In Europe, privacy is considered a fundamental right. So here we might think of freedom of speech and freedom of religion uh, as fundamental rights, and there they include in those fundamental rights um, the right of privacy. And they have a much broader definition of privacy than we have traditionally had in the US. So our level of protection is not adequate. Um, but in order for companies to do business between the U.S. and Europe, they need um, a way to transfer data back and forth. Um, uh, with this main uh, data shield mechanism invalidated, companies are having to fall back on the current backup method, which is a set of clauses called standard contractual clauses that cannot be, uh, they cannot be altered or, or amended in any way. And it's much more than simply slapping the clauses on the back of a contract. Um, there is an additional burden now under the Schrems reeling, ruling um, that companies must think carefully about where the transferred data is going and what protections are in place to prevent U.S. intelligence officials and other third parties from accessing it. That was the main reason Privacy Shield got shot down, because the European Union's top court did not want the data of European citizens being available to U.S. intelligence agencies. Moving from privacy to the closely related area of data security, at least 25 states have enacted specific data security laws that, um, that generally obligate businesses to maintain reasonable security measures without providing a clear definition of what are reasonable security measures. So companies need to look to evaluate their existing security procedures and policies to make sure that they're complying with this law. Delaware is one that, as part of its data breach law, has a provision that requires companies to maintain reasonable security measures. Some states go into more detail about what security measures are required. For example, in 2010, Massachusetts was the first to set forth 
more specific cybersecurity requirements for businesses that maintain electronic data on any resident of Massachusetts. So you think, well, why do I care about Massachusetts? Well, if your database contains the, the data of one Massachusetts resident, then you're subject to this law. And that's the same reason why companies are subject to the CCPA and many other state laws, because people do business, companies do business outside of their region. And there are people that travel between regions. And so a company even inadvertently could easily have the data of individuals that are located in many different states. Um, it's a lot of wiggle room in the Massachusetts law about, about whether a particular uh, security requirement is technically feasible. And Massachusetts, even though it could apply to many companies, is not really the focus of many companies. But more specific data security laws have been passed now in other states. And most specifically, or most significantly, I would say the New York SHIELD Act is one. SHIELD stands for Stop Hacks and Improve Electronic Data Security. So SHIELD is a lot easier to remember than that. Um, it has a lot of detailed requirements about data security that apply to a much broader set of companies. It applies to any business that owns or licenses computerized data that includes the private data of a New York resident. So how many people have the data of a New York resident in their database? The data breach portion took effect in October of 2019, and the data security portion took effect in March of 2020. Um, under the data breach portion, there's a much broader definition of data breach. Um, there's a broader definition of private information, and there are specific deadlines as to how quickly notice needs to go to data subjects in the event of a breach. And there's a requirement that the, um, that the state attorney general in New York is notified of a breach involving, involving um, data subjects in New York with significant financial penalties for failure within the time period to provide that notice. Um, the data security portion that took effect in March 21 of 2020 is, is very useful to look at closely because it requires businesses to have a security program. And as many laws say, it says you've got to have proper administrative, technical, and physical safeguards um, of your data. But it gives specific examples of what are reasonable practices. Um, and so, for example, administrative safeguards would include designating an employee to coordinate a security program, conducting a risk assessment, reviewing existing security measures. Reasonable technical safeguards would include an assessment of the risks of the network and software design, risks in information handling, and the establishment of systems to detect, prevent, and respond to attacks or system failures. And physical safeguards would include assessing the risk of information storage and disposal. Is, is your information that you no longer need being uh, disposed of or destroyed in a, um, in a secure, safe and secure manner? Um, and the risks of detecting, preventing and respond to intrusions, making sure your doors are locked, uh, guarding against unauthorized access to private information and disposing of information within a reasonable amount of time. Now, how much harder is this when your workforce is now working from home uh, during the COVID crisis, and you don't have control of the physical um, perimeter of your workers, uh, they're in their home environment. And not only that, they may not be using company-issued devices. They may be using personal devices. Um, this has dramatically increased the attack profile of companies um, and is requiring additional risk assessment and additional policies to be put in place and additional training of users. Users who are, who are fearful of, of COVID-19, are fearful of what's happening to them financially, are fearful of the future, are getting very um, specifically directed phishing emails that are offering information. Here's how to get your stimulus check from the government. Uh, fill out this form to get your stimulus check deposited directly into your account. 
Um, here's what you need to know about COVID infections. And these emails are coming in with, um, with malicious links and malicious uh, programs. They're being downloaded, could be ransomware. There's been a huge increase in ransomware attacks. So um, all of these safeguards are requiring that the companies do a lot of additional work now um, as a result of people working from home. The, um, the New York Shield Act is interesting in that it requires an annual certification of compliance from the board of directors. And if the, and if the certification is, is made falsely, uh, potential criminal penalties for members of the board. This is going to get their attention. So the legislature is ramping up the incentives for companies to comply with these laws. Biometrics, as we've talked about several times, is a really hot area um, because of facial recognition technology. Um, Illinois was the first to pass biometric legislation in, in 20, 2008 and it's still the, um, the most significant law that's been passed because it requires that individuals um, be notified um, that their biometric information is being collected or stored and the purpose of the collection and that the individuals provide a written release um, to collect that information. And the written release has to be received by the company in advance. And not only is this very difficult to fulfill, the law allows a private right of action. There was a court case decided last year by the Illinois Supreme Court, the case was Six Flags, and it ruled that an aggrieved person, someone who's, who suffered a violation of this law, did not need to allege injury to have standing to sue. So that all they have to do is show that the, um, that the law has been violated and they're entitled to a private right of action with statutory damages. And this is huge, and there's been a flood of class action lawsuits being brought in Illinois. There are other states that have um, introduced um, laws governing uh, collection of biometric information, Texas and Washington not notably. Many other states have tried and failed so far. Um, and biometrics is mentioned in a number of different laws that are not specifically targeted to biometrics meaning that the law that biometric data is included within the definition of private information or personal information in various laws. So I told you a little bit about what's in the Illinois law. Texas law requires in, in, informed consent also, but uh, does not have a private cause of action, and it limits the sale or disclosure of biometric identifiers. Um, Washington um, prohibits individuals, companies or individuals from entering biometric data into a database without providing notice and gaining consent as well. The problem with security and biometric data is that if someone steals your biometric information, you can't change it. Like you can change a social security number or you can change a bank account. And so this is, um, this is what we call permanent data. Geolocation and contract contact tracing. I uh, kept meaning to change that to contact tracing, not contract tracing. I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> is uh, raises fresh privacy and security questions. Employers and public health officials um, have turned to measures such as temperature checks, health surveys, um, and other kinds of contact tracing. Um, and these methods are raising questions about the extent to which they infringe on individual property rights. Uh, privacy rights, rather, and also what happens to the sensitive information once it's been collected? How long are they going to keep it? What, what else are they allowed to do with it? Are they allowed to sell it to anybody? There have been many legislative proposals to hold companies liable for misusing this information um, and, and limit how contact tracing apps, including those developed by Apple and Google, can sweep up users' data. Um, there have been many data security headaches relating to this, uh, significant spikes in ransomware, phishing, and other malicious attacks. And, um, and um, even though contact tracing is considered critical for public health during the pandemic. 
Uh, there's no overarching federal privacy law that specifically applies to digital contact tracing, even though some have been proposed in Congress. So developers and employers and public health authorities may be subject to any number of different state or federal privacy laws. And which laws apply depends very much on the context, including the jurisdiction, and what data is being collected and how it's being used. So an example, of course, is the um, Illinois um, Biometric Information Privacy Act, um, because a lot of the data that contact tracing collects may be biometric data. Uh, the CCPA requires disclosure of this type of data, um, disclosure if you're collecting this type of data, and also you need to disclose the purpose of collecting the data. Um, the, health, um, the health privacy law, HIPAA, um, creates potential legal claims um, if a covered entity, meaning a hospital or a doctor's office or any business associate doing business with those companies, collects data without proper disclosures and or misuses that data. Also, there are common law privacy torts and there's potential Fourth Amendment search and seizure claims. So it's really a hodgepodge right now of how, um, how geolocation and contact tracing can be, um, can be policed and monitored and individuals are rightly very concerned about that. Um, we've talked a few times about destruction uh, Delaware has, and many states have, Safe Destruction of Records Act, and this applies to commercial entities that are seeking to permanently dispose of records containing personal information. And, these com and this applies to both paper records and electronic records. Companies are required to take reasonable steps to destroy or arrange for the destruction of the records by shredding, erasing, or otherwise destroying or modifying uh, personal information to make it unreadable or indecipherable. And this goes back to a key risk that we're facing these days, and that is the massive proliferation of information that's being collected. And the laws are focusing on why, why information is being collected, how it's being used, and how long it's kept. So it's very important um, that companies and, and governmental entities look at what information you're collecting and why are you collecting it, how long you're keeping it, and how you're disposing of it. Even if you dispose of devices that are part of your, um, your network, is there information on those devices um, that goes, goes out with it when you throw away the device? So all of this um, goes back to making sure you track your data and you know where your data is located. Um, there are, um, and there are private rights of action for violation of this. Some of, some of these key considerations I've touched on that you should consider, and that is what data um, are you generating in your business? And where is it flowing? Um, do you have necessary consents to collect that data? Are you collecting data that fall within certain sensitive data categories where different rules apply? And in how you're using the data, can it be de-identified? Can it be anonymized or pseudonymized in a way that protects the identity of individuals and possibly cannot be reconnected to an individual later? What are you doing with the data? What rights do you have in it? And what happens to the data at the end of the relationship? A lot of this involves vendor management, where companies, especially with the amount of outsourcing taking place and with remote working, uh, there's an increased reliance on vendors to provide um, to provide necessary services and have access to data. So it's important to look in the vendor agreement to see how the vendors are obligated to protect information that they receive from the customers. Do they are they limited to using it solely for that customer's benefit, or can they separately monetize that data? If the vendor anonymizes the data, can they turn around and sell it to others? And there are a lot of concerns. Um, how can you be sure that the data is destroyed or returned at the end of the relationship? Uh, practical guidance that you should consider is first to understand what laws and regulations apply to your business. 
report to your governmental entity um, and see what those requirements are and how to fulfill them. Conduct a risk assessment. Look at your business practices and identify where are the risks and what, do, what have I done to mitigate those risks. Make sure you have uh, reasonable written information security program in place and make sure you have a privacy program in place that includes uh, internal uh, instruction to individuals as to how you handle data, um, what kind of training your employees have in the collection of data, and also what sort of outward-facing notices you're providing to data subjects. And data subjects are not just individual consumers that you may be doing business with. They also include your employees. Uh, and they include your business partners, your service providers, your commercial customers, and their employees. Um, so there are a lot of individuals that fall within the scope of um, needing consideration in, in privacy programs. Make sure as part of your security program to have an incident response plan. When a breach takes place, I didn't say if, but when, you need to know what to do um, right away because it's a panic situation. You need to have a team that can be pulled together. You need to know who, how to make the first call. Um, when in the COVID era, when everybody's working from home, you need to make sure you can contact everybody. Do you have everybody's personal cell information? Do you have their home address? Do you have other ways of communicating if the network is down, if email is down, if cell service is down? Um, and then have a plan for um, identifying, uh, remediating, and communicating an incident. Make sure employees are trained on security and privacy obligations. The biggest vulnerability companies have with security are employees making a mistake, employees clicking on the wrong links and emails. In, a, in my office, we get, um, <clears throat> we get phishing emails that are sent to us um, as part of training to see if anybody's going to click on it. So they try to make them as enticing as possible, and then we find out later how many of us simply deleted the messages, how many of us fell for it, and then there's additional training uh, that comes as part of that. This training is critically important. Conduct risk assessments on your third-party vendors. Find out what access do your vendors have to your data, what they're doing with the data, and how reliable are those vendors. Um, do you have the right provisions in your contract so that um, they have the obligations and you have the enforcement mechanisms that you need to protect your data? Also, look at your insurance coverage. Make sure you're covered for cyber-related incidents. With that, I would like to, um, to turn it back over um, for any questions that may have arisen. Bill, thank you very much. I think we did have a couple of questions come in. Um, one is what SP or what SP 800 slash 171 and uh, and CMMC was the question there. Uh, CMMC, um, I'm remembering what that is, so I can't. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to look get back to you. Okay, we can take that as an action item to get back with people and then also um, I think Robert had put something there. It says ruling 3.1.9 and 171 add AC.2005 and CMMC. I don't know what he was referring to. CM CMMC is a DOD new news privacy regulation is what he said. That's it. That's it. It, it has okay. to do with, it has to do with uh, de Department of Defense um, requirements that apply to service providers that um, enter into contract with Department of Defense. Very good guidance as to uh, what sort of policy provisions you should have in place, um, but not binding except if you're in that relationship with Department of Defense. Okay. That's what we had so far. So uh, what I'd like to do is just to take a uh, couple of minutes. We have uh, a few minutes left. If you can go to the slide, just kind of give everybody an overview of, of CyberCrunch and who we are. And again, thank you everybody for joining. And uh, a perfect segue as Bill was, uh, you know, talking about making sure you know who you're doing work with from a vendor's perspective. Uh, CyberCrunch was founded in 2012. Uh, we have a headquartered in Green or headquartered in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Also, we have an office in Aston, PA. 
Um, and we do a lot of business with all the vertical markets from healthcare to finance to uh, retail and manufacturing and talking about all the compliances and, and laws and that we need to follow by is, you know, we are HIPAA, GDPR, um, FERPA, GLBA compliances, and also we are R2 certified and NAIT certified. And what NAIT certified means to, to you is that we are audited on a regular basis, uh, making sure that we are doing things correctly um, and keeping us up to par. And uh, again, making sure that we are compliant uh, when taking care of anybody's data. Um, and I'll let you uh, go over to the next slide, Bill. And the problems and issues that we solve for customers is e-waste. So we take anything pretty much with a plug uh, that's decommissioned, uh, laptops, desktops, servers, cell phones, iPads, uh, printers, and we take that uh, to our facility, we pick that up and we then recycle that. And then anything from a data destruction side uh, when it comes to hard drives that do need to be shredded, um, degaussed, um, swiped, uh, whatever, whatever the compliance your company calls for, uh, we follow those. Uh, we follow those instructions and compliances. And when that's all said and done, we provide you with a we call a COR certificate of recycling and a certificate of destruction if we need to do any of the destruction on the hard drives. Um, and we will definitely send some information out, uh, you know, regarding CyberCrunch and our um, service offerings that we offer. Um, also, if you can, I think that's this slide. If you go to the next slide, Bill. Uh, and I just mentioned this as to what we destroy, you know, anything with a, with a plug from hard drives, uh, other storage devices, cell phones, tablets, pin pad uh, when it comes to POS systems in retail, um, circuit memory boards, uh, anything along those lines. Also, from a destruction types, I was mentioning the hard drives. We can shred them, pulverize them, degauss them, a Department of Defense uh, swiping uh, and or secure transport. So, again, whatever your company is requiring, uh, we can abide by those uh, by those rules and regulations as Bill was touching on before in his presentation and make sure that we follow the guidelines uh, again to to do it correctly for your business and what you guys uh, call for. Um, I think that's the last slide, Bill, if I'm not mistaken. I think the next one's going to have our contact information. Um, and again, we will share this presentation and I'll shoot an email out to everyone that will have uh, myself and Al's contact on there as well as Bill's and also follow up with a copy of the presentation and some more detailed information on CyberCrunch and how we maybe uh, might be able to help your business, um, again, with your uh, recycling as well as your data destruction needs. So uh, I don't know if there's any other questions that you guys have out there. Um, and I'll, I'll look at the chat window with regards to the CyberCrunch piece. Uh, I didn't see any other questions, Bill, on uh, on your side coming okay. through, but again, this is recorded and- uh, Greg, I'm gonna I've yeah, got question, Greg. Um, how, how has your company been affected by um, by the stay-at-home orders and by the um, and by the remote work uh, during the COVID? So yes, I mean that's a great question. Uh, you know, we're all working remotely. Um, you know, we are slowly starting to see some of the businesses open up for for meetings. Uh, Definitely with the social distancing, but again, uh, I am working remote. Uh, Al works remote, um, but you know we got to follow the uh, the guidelines of the CDC, and you know we got to wear a mask. We got to do the social distancing. A lot of our meetings are being done like we're doing today right now via webinar. Um, and like I said, there are some companies uh, that are again still all work from home. Uh, I was watching the news last week or a few weeks ago or even longer than that and they were talking that in downtown pittsburgh i'd say we're 50 percent of the buildings um currently were vacant at that time because nobody was coming in and traffic going into town so you're seeing it out there but i think you're also start starting to slowly see people go back maybe a couple of days a week if they're not going back full time i really see i really see this uh going to remote, you know, working from home or working remotely. And uh, in, in my opinion, you got to be dedicated. And I think sometimes you see more um, more people doing more work because you're, you know, you're not commuting back and forth for an hour or two. And uh, I think people are getting, uh, more people are getting stuff done from home than, than going into an office. So. Yeah. So, so I've got another question. I was looking at the NIST guidelines regarding um, data destruction. 
and sometimes there's a requirement when it, when information is shredded um, of the particle size of the uh, of the resulting um, shred, and and apparently for different types of technology, the particle size has to be very small to avoid the possibility that data could be recovered from it. Have you have you seen that as an issue, and and have you um, have you dealt with that? I have not. Al, have you any of that? I'll, I'll open it up to you for that question, Al, if you want to. Um, with, there are different levels of shred. There is, you know, you could go half inch, quarter inch, whatever. I mean, we haven't ran into anything that where somebody can actually touch it all that. Or to the shredded, I mean, there's different levels of shredding that we can do. It depends on what your company is looking for. But um, we do it, we, our average is uh, half inch. 